Stay hungry, stay foolish. Today's episode introduces new hope for those suffering from conditions like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, addictions, PTSD, ADHD, and more. Though incidence of these conditions is skyrocketing, for the past four years, standard treatment hasn't much changed. Meanwhile, the stigma of the mental illness label can often prevent sufferers from getting help they need. Today's guest is an innovator in his field, a brain specialist and best-selling author who is on the forefront of a new movement within medicine and related disciplines that aims to change all that. Today we draw on his latest findings and the findings of neuroscience to challenge an outdated psychiatric paradigm. It will help us all take control and improve the health of our own brains, minimizing and reversing conditions that may prevent us from living a full and emotionally rich life. The end of mental illness will help us discover why labeling someone as having a mental illness is not only inaccurate but harmful, why standard treatment may not have helped you or a loved one, and why diagnosing and treating you based on your symptoms alone so often misses the true cause of symptoms and results in poor outcomes. At least 100 simple things we can do to heal our brains and prevent or reverse the problems that are making us feel sad, mad or bad. It is a great pleasure to welcome multiple best-selling author, change maker, and author of The End of Mental Illness, How Neuroscience is Transforming Psychiatry and Helping Prevent or Reverse Mood and Anxiety Disorders, ADHD, Addictions, PTSD, Psychosis, Personality Disorders, and more. Dr. Daniel Amen, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Aidan. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. One of the many, many benefits of your work is empathy towards others. For example, you opened the book with a story, and a story that really opens our minds when you saw a 30-something man, about 5 foot 10, with a dirty blonde hair, ripped clothes, and blood on his face, talking to himself while gesturing wildly in the air. I did, yeah. I was at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. And here in California, the homelessness epidemic is just out of control. And most of my colleagues would have thought he had schizophrenia or an unstable bipolar disorder. And why wouldn't he just take his medication? Where when I see someone like that, I wondered, well, when was the last time he had a brain injury? What's going on in his gut? Does he have an infection like Lyme disease that may be ravaging his brain? And if we don't start thinking about these things in a different way, we're going to get what we have, which is an escalating incidence of mental health problems around the world. And I mentioned, Daniel, in the opening that you are an innovator and disruptor in your field. Your work discards an outdated stigmatizing paradigm that taints people with disparaging labels. And we often talk on this show about reframing problems, whether it be in business or personally, and how that changes the solutions. And you've done this. You say, we are not dealing with mental health issues, but we are dealing with brain health issues. And it is this one idea that has changed everything. Well, certainly everything for me and how I think about myself, my children, the patients we see at Amen Clinics. And I helped a clinic in South Florida at imaging. I mean, that's one of the special things I've done over the years. And as I went to give a lecture, I saw what they were serving. They were serving pancakes and pastries. And I'm like, oh, great. We're going to work in, on their mental health issues while we damage their brains and their bodies. And there's just something about that that's insane <laughs> when you understand that if you eat pro inflammatory foods, your mood's not going to be good. Your ability to focus isn't going to be good. And we just need to be thinking about this differently, that when the brain gets better, your mood is better, your focus is better, your energy is better, your anxiety is less. And I just love this concept so much. And I have to tell you, I hate the term mental illness. And I decided to be a psychiatrist 40 years ago. 
And I hated it then. I thought, oh no, you don't want to diagnose someone with a mental illness because they won't want to get help. It shames them and they're not mental. They're brain and that's what the imaging work has taught us. And you mentioned this, shame holds people back from getting the help they need. And I'd love to share this because if there's people out there struggling, listen to the show or know others, maybe they'll reframe it and see them as differently. Maybe for example, somebody's bad behavior or somebody being extra aggressive was a brain injury when they were a child. Well, one of the big lessons from the book, there's actually a whole chapter on it, is undiagnosed brain injuries are a major cause of psychiatric problems. And nobody knows it because very few psychiatrists in the US or in Europe or around the world look at the brain in their patients. So think about that cardiologist look, neurologist look, your orthopedic doctor looks, every other medical specialty looks at the organ they treat, but psychiatrists guess based on whatever you tell them. So you go, I'm depressed, and they go, oh, well, we'll give you a diagnosis of depression. Well, that's sort of silly, right? I mean, if somebody came and said, I have chest pain, Nobody gives them the diagnosis of chest pain because it doesn't tell you what causes it or what to do about it. And if we see someone who's depressed, it could be their brain works too hard and they can't stop thinking about negative things. It could be their brain doesn't work hard enough and they can't think, which leads them to demoralization. And so the, the imaging really changed everything for me. But when you try to change a medical specialty, watch out because <laughs> there's going to be all sorts of haters coming after you. Yeah. And it's the same with any change maker. And it's one of the dual benefits of having you on the show. One, you've done this against huge resistance, but you've changed lives, you've changed families, you've changed generations. And I love when the paradigm starts to change. And you even share this, you mentioned about when you introduced SPECT imaging, it was the same as Thomas Kuhn's Five Stages of Scientific Revolution. That book was just so helpful to me because I realized that other people experience the same problems that I experience when they try to change a medical specialty or any kind of scientific specialty. And he has these five stages. Stage one is the discrepancies show in the traditional paradigm. So standard things begin to fall apart. And so, for example, if I would diagnose someone with ADHD and put them on a stimulant, now they become suicidal or aggressive. Okay, well, that's a discrepancy. That's a problem. Stage two is the disagreements start. People start recognizing the discrepancies and then they start to fight about it. That certainly has been going on in psychiatry forever. Stage three is the revolution. A new paradigm is introduced, like what we do at Amen Clinics. We believe you should look at the brain. Of course, we talk to people and we assess you in all sorts of different ways, but if we don't look, you don't know. And the fourth one is actually the most predictable stage. It's the rejection. When a new theory is put forth, the haters come out and they ridicule you and call you bad names. And quite frankly, I wasn't ready for it. It hurt my feelings. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be part of the psychiatric group. I was a member of the American Psychiatric Association for 32 years, and yet I find myself in a fight. So I was rejected. But then the acceptance happens. New theory is adopted by younger people, and it was actually the German physicist Max Planck who said, progress in science happens through funerals, <laughs> that the old guard needs to die. And the, the young people go, well, of course you need a new way. Of course it makes sense to look at the brain. So it's one reason I'm 65 where I exercise, I eat right, my weight is healthy, my important health numbers are good because I'm going to outlive these people. 
because if you don't look, you don't know. And I'm really weary of people shaming people who have bad behavior rather than trying to help them. Yeah, and you mentioned there about looking, and we hear people saying that mental health is such a hidden issue, but with SPECT imaging, it's hidden no longer. And your imaging work provides us with a greater understanding of the brain, which led you to identify 12 simple principles about the brain and behaviors that you cover in depth in your previous book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. But let's share those 12 briefly, Daniel. Number one is super simple. Actually, all of these are very simple. Your brain is involved in everything you do how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people. Two is when your brain works right, you work right. But when your brain is troubled for whatever reason, you're much more likely to have trouble in your life. When your brain works right, you're happier, you're healthier, you're wealthier because you make better decisions and you're more successful overall. When your brain is troubled for whatever reason, you had a head injury, you've been exposed to an environmental toxin, you've had an infection, you're sadder, sicker, poorer, less successful. Number three is your brain's the most complicated organ in the universe, it's so cool. Even though it's only 2% of your body's weight, it uses 20 to 30% of the calories you consume. It has 100 billion neurons, each neuron's connected to other neurons by up to 10,000 individual connections, which means you have more connections than there are stars in the universe. Four is your brain has needs that must be met in order to work optimally, which means you need to eat right, you need to breathe clean air, drink clean water, not be under a tremendous amount of stress. So your brain has needs and it need those needs need to be met. And then Five is so important, and I really never thought about it until I started imaging the brain, which is your brain is soft, about the consistency of soft butter, tofu, custard, somewhere between egg whites and jello, and it's housed in a really hard skull that has sharp, bony ridges. This is why you should not let children hit soccer balls with their head, which is why they should not be playing tackle football or contact sports that put them at risk for concussions because those concussions can change the trajectory of their life. Six is many things hurt the brain. We'll talk about that when we go through our bright minds risk factors. And seven is many things help the brain. And you know, the ultimate tiny habit, the smallest thing you can do today that'll make the biggest difference is ask yourself, whatever you do, is this good for your brain or bad for it? And if you know what hurts and what helps and you love yourself, right? Because doing the right thing is never about you should do it. It's do you love yourself? And if you love yourself, then you'll choose the right thing. Eight is certain brain systems tend to do certain things. So problems in these systems tend to cause specific problems. And I do a little bit of practical neuroscience in the book. And nine is looking at the brain just changes everything. Yesterday I looked at a world champion mixed martial artist brain and he fell in love with his brain. And that's why I love looking at the brain. It's like, oh, this isn't good. What is it I can do to make it better? Nine is all psychiatric illnesses are not single or simple disorders. This is why you have to scan people. Depression, they're like, 10 different types of depression. Addicts, I wrote a book called Unchain Your Brain about addictions are not one thing, there are at least six different things. There are impulsive addicts, compulsive addicts, sad addicts, anxious addicts. So know your type. 11 is the brain has only so much reserve. As you age, if you're not paying attention, you're gonna to begin to lose your memory and your good decision making because age you know, I call it the gravity of age, will really steal brain function from you. And the most important lesson from imaging that I've learned is you're not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better and I can prove it. Here at Amen Clinics, we did the world's largest study on active and retired NFL players. 
We've done 300 NFL players, a number of Hall of Fame players like Terry Bradshaw and Jack Youngblood. And 80% of our players get better in as little as two months if they start loving their brain and rehabilitating them. So even if you've been bad to your brain, you can make it better if you do the right things. This is the message psychiatry should embrace is we are a brain specialty. And if you don't start with brain health, you shame people and you stigmatize them and you lose. And our outcomes are no better than they were in the 1950s. We have to do better. You give loads of case studies throughout the book. You show a before and after scan. So before the brain maybe with a head trauma or perhaps it was because of smoking or alcohol abuse, etc. And it shows what the blood flow is like to the brain. Then it shows afterwards after some treatment. But I'd love to have explained what SPECT imaging was versus MRI. So MRI and CAT scans typically are structural scans or anatomy scans. They show what the brain actually physically looks like. SPECT, like PAT, and a number of other studies are functional scans. They look at how the brain works. So SPECT tells us three things, good activity, too little, or too much. And so if your brain works too hard, we want to calm it down. If your brain doesn't work hard enough, we want to stimulate it. And the images, they just changed everything. People fall in love with their brain, which means they're more compliant and they're more likely to do the behavioral or lifestyle interventions that help them get better quicker. And I'd love if we'd share a case study here. I mentioned how reading this book and reading your books in general develop empathy and you see people as differently. So somebody's acting perhaps out of order or somebody's acting out of sorts. You firstly start thinking, I wonder what's going on with their brain. And you give a great case study here of a common issue in society, which is divorce and the case study of Dave and Bonnie. I love that story. So Dave and Bonnie failed marital therapy. They got an F after three years, uh, spending thousands of dollars, a lot of time, the therapist basically told them to get divorced, which means she flunked them. And they wanted to be married. And so they got mad at her and she got anxious and said, well, I know a doctor in Southern California that takes care of really difficult people. <laughs> and so she sent them to me. And, you know, when we scanned them, Bonnie's brain was fine, but Dave's brain looked very toxic, looked like a drug addict's brain. But in his history, we, always, we take very detailed histories on our patients. He said he never drank and he didn't do drugs. But what's the first thing we learn in psychiatry school about drug addicts is they lie. So in front of his wife, we asked him, is that really true? You don't drink, you've never done drugs. And he said, Dr. Amen, I have many problems. That's not it. And I then looked to his wife and I said, is that true? And she said, oh yes, Dr. Amen, he doesn't drink. As far as I know, he's never done drugs. He's just a jerk. <laughs> and I laughed when she said that. But then in my head, I'm like, well, why does his brain look so bad? And went through the possibilities. Drugs and alcohol, well, probably not if his wife, who doesn't like him much, says no. An environmental toxin, a near drowning episode, hypothyroidism, an infection, severe anemia. And so my next question to Dave was, well, where do you work? And he said, I work in a furniture factory. What do you do? I finish furniture all day long. He was doing drugs. In fact, he was doing the worst drug of abuse, which is inhaling organic solvents and taking him out of work and rehabilitating his brain was so important. And I remember, you know, I'm beginning to piece this together and I asked Bonnie, so when did he become a jerk? And she said, what do you mean? I said, did you marry him that way? Do you have daddy issues that you're trying to work <laughs> out? And she said, no, when we dated and we were first married, he was great. But it was about five years ago, his behavior started to change. And that's when she put her hand over her mouth and said, oh, my God, 
That's about the time his behavior changed. Do you think in his attempt to be a good husband by going to work and supporting his family, he's being poisoned? And so you just see how the imaging changed everything. Did Dave have a mental illness? I mean, his last doctor diagnosed him with bipolar disorder, ADHD. So she clearly thought he had a mental illness. But when it's informed with imaging, he didn't have a mental illness, he had a brain illness. And when you get his brain right, his behavior's better. And they're still married, and they're not seeing therapists because we've rehabilitated his brain. So he could use what the therapist gave him. I'm a huge fan of therapists once your brain works right. But if you do therapy, With a brain that doesn't work right, it's sort of like doing software programming on people who have hardware problems. And one might think that's insane. That why would you do that? Because they won't remember what you worked on or they won't be able to control the strategies that you gave them. And then they feel bad. It's not only a waste of money and a waste of time. It's demoralizing. As a way to introduce Bright Minds, you mentioned strategies, and the Bright Mind strategy is absolutely brilliant. But let's, before we do that, share the four circles first, Daniel, because that will help us understand a wider structure before we get into the strategy of Bright Minds. So the end of mental illness is really based around four circles and a Bright Minds paradigm. And so this is how I think about patients or in our eight clinics around the U.S., this is always how we think of people. That when I was in medical school, our dean said, you know, never think of people as their diagnoses. Always think about them in four big circles. So it's critical to understand their biology or how their body works. And in our case, the physical functioning of the brain their psychology or how their mind works, their social circle, which is who do you hang out with in their current stresses, and their spiritual circle, which is, well, why the heck do they care? Why are they on the planet? What is their deepest sense of meaning and purpose? So understanding those four circles is really critical. And in biology, you need to know the 11 major risk factors that help keep your brain healthy or can rescue your brain if you're in trouble. And I created a mnemonic with my team at Amen Clinics called Bright Minds. So to keep your brain healthy or rescue it if it's headed to the dark place, we have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. But always thinking about those in the context of these four circles. So get your brain right, get your mind right. I often talk about killing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts that steal your happiness. Got to get your relationships right in the context of why the heck do you care? What is your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? The ants one, I'd love to focus on that before we go on to the Bright Minds mnemonic, because this one is so important also for children. And I think helping and getting children into these positive brain habits early can absolutely change the world. And the whole idea of journaling and gratitude exercises are so important here. So someone I love, a 10-year-old boy who I saw last week, we do an online computer neuropsychological assessment and he scored the worst on negativity bias. And it just breaks my heart. And so when I was with him, he also has Tourette's, which is a tick disorder. So people go, that's a mental illness. And I'm like, now it's brain illness. Uh, you could see it on the scans. And his parents put him on an elimination diet. And when I saw him, I'm like, how are you? He said, I don't like any of the foods. (laughs) And I'm like, you don't like any of them? And he said, no. 
And I was with him for three days. And so that's an ant. We call it an all or nothing ant. He's now found 75 foods he loves that loves him back. And I'm doing positivity training with him. So what is that? Every day he starts the day with today is going to be a great day. And before he goes to bed at night, he has a journal and he writes down what went well today. And in the journal, he also writes down things he's grateful for. So learning to kill the ants, you don't have to believe every stupid thing you think and directing your mind in a helpful way is so important. I have a children's book that I love called Captain Snout and the superpower questions. And a lot of teachers actually teach on it in kindergarten and first grade. And it just goes to these really important psychological principles uh, that you can train your mind to be positive or left undisciplined, your brain can really hurt you. And in your life, you've experienced a lot of trauma with brain disorders. And this is a nice way to introduce Bright Minds because you experienced this. And the first letter is B, which is for blood flow. So when blood flow is low, it's the first thing that is a major predictor of Alzheimer's disease, but it's also associated with depression, schizophrenia, and ADHD. And SPECT is a blood flow study. And it's critical, as I want people to love their brains, I also want them to love their blood vessels. Because if you love your blood vessels, you'll avoid things that hurt them, like caffeine and nicotine, high blood pressure, being sedentary, and you'll do things that help them. And that's basically, with the bright minds, know if you have the risk factor, and then do whatever you can to treat or prevent it. And so, in the book, I actually tell the story of my niece, who I dedicate this book to my two nieces who are loaded for mental illness. They have family history of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, addictions, depression, suicide, multiple suicides. But genes only load the gun. It's what happens to you that pulls the trigger. And they were raised in chaos, multiple moves, multiple schools, parents were, were depressed, addicted, had domestic violence. And I think everybody would agree these girls are at a very high risk for mental illness. This whole book is about how do I prevent it in these kids and their children and grandchildren. And when I first scanned Alizé, the older one, she had very low blood flow, which horrified me. You know, at 13, her brain looked like she was 80 and it was bad for 80. And so I put her in a hyperbaric chamber to try to reverse the damage. I put her on some supplements, a little bit of a stimulant medication. And now she's a straight A student. She loves her life. She treats it much better. You know, I'm just so proud of her. Millions of people like her or the reason I wrote this book. You give all the solutions for each of these in each chapter. And we have to tell a listener here, there's a chapter for each of the letters of the mnemonic, but a couple of top line ones here, for example, one that really I was shocked by was drinking no more than two caffeinated drinks a day because that constricts blood flow to the brain. And I didn't know this, but when I first started doing SPACT, caffeine could constrict blood flow up to 30% on the scans. And anything that constricts blood flow to the brain is bad for the brain. It prematurely ages the brain. So let's do the right thing. And if you're addicted to caffeine, it's either because you didn't get enough sleep or you have other bad habits or you're addicted right? Because caffeine is an addictive substance. We know if people are drinking four or five, six cups of coffee a day and they don't, the next day they're going to have withdrawal. They'll be tired, they'll have headaches, and less is better. And some of the other ones limit salt intake, incorporate foods such as beet juice, 
broccoli, celery, garlic, etc. There's so much in each of these chapters that we're not going to get through today. But moving on to or, because this one is fascinating. This one's retirement. So retirement and aging, and I hate this one the older I get, because, you know, the older you get, the less blood flow you have to the brain, unless you're serious about being in love with your brain and doing the right things for it. When you stop learning, your brain starts dying. And that's why staying actively engaged is so important. But there are other risk factors here too, such as loneliness is associated with premature aging of the brain. High iron levels, as iron goes up, If it's too high, it can cause premature aging. So my iron tends to run high. So every year I make sure I donate blood to keep my brain healthy. We're going to have to rush through these a little bit. And I highly recommend this book because you do go deeply into each one. And then at the end of each chapter, you give solutions. So you give even nutraceuticals, which we'll cover before we end up today's show which help the brain and help different aspects of the brain. But the next is inflammation. Which, and I think almost all of my colleagues would agree, is a major cause of depression and dementia. And we are inflamed across the world because of processed foods diet, processed foods diets, and low levels of omega-3s and unhealthy gut bugs. And I'm like, hey, I thought we were talking about the brain. What does the gut have to do with the brain? Just everything, right? Your brain is an organ, just like your heart is an organ. And if your gut's not right, your heart's not right. But also your brain is not right. We have 100 trillion gut bugs and they make neurotransmitters. They help you digest your food. They detoxify you. They're involved in making hormones. And if your diet's not right, your gut and brain are not right in large part because your body becomes inflamed. And a new study showed that 98% of the population has low levels of omega-3 fatty acid, which increase your risk of inflammation. And it's because we're not eating as much fish or clean, healthy fish as we have in the past. You tell us about taking probiotics, et cetera, which we won't go into now because that one's kind of basic. But one that, again, shocked me was the importance of gum health and the importance of flossing. Yeah, no, I was at the dentist yesterday and my gums were really healthy, which made me very happy. But gum disease is a major cause of inflammation. If your teeth aren't right and your gums bleed when you floss or you're not flossing, odds are both your heart and your brain are not as healthy as they could be. So that's an easy low lying fruit for us all to take on. And then the next, the G of bright minds is genetics. And we actually don't think about genetics in quite the right way. I argue that genes are not a death sentence, but they're a wake up call. So many people think, well, I'm overweight because I have fat genes in my family. And I was like, no, you have bad habits and you have a genetic vulnerability. So I have the genes that say I should be obese. I have a 67% chance of being obese, but I'm not because I don't give in to the behaviors that make it likely to be so. And I have to really watch it. You know, if I sort of let myself go quickly, I can gain 10 or 20 pounds. But I have a brother and a sister who are both 150 pounds overweight and it just horrifies me you know i wish they'd listen to me but you know i'm a middle child nobody listened to me (laughs) but genes aren't a death sentence that's the most important thing to understand and you want to know your risk factors and then prevent them as soon as possible Yeah, and I loved the cherry blossom studies and the mice by researchers Brian Diaz and Kerry Ressler. I'd love if you shared this. Well, I love that study too, because it shows 
that sometimes your issues are not yours. They're somebody else's. So in the study from Emory, they made mice afraid of the scent of cherry blossoms. So they gave them a mild shock whenever the scent was in the air. And what they discovered was their babies were afraid of the scent of cherry blossoms and their grandbabies were afraid of the scent of cherry blossoms that, you know, it's not just the genes we inherit from our parents and grandparents, that it's actually what happened to their genes. It's called epigenetics. It's what happened to them that can affect us. So in a new book I'm working on, I call them ancestral dragons that, you know, you may be playing out the unresolved conflicts of your parents and grandparents. That one is absolutely fascinating. The next one I know, unfortunately, all too well, which is H, which is head trauma. And in NFL, as you know, you you were a quarterback in school. You played uh, school football. They wear helmets. But in rugby, which I played, we didn't wear helmets. And even if we did, the protection was limited. And I've been knocked out cold many times, hospitalized once. And the funny thing is I thought many ex-sports people and many ex-rugby players suffer from mental illness because they struggled with letting go of who they used to be or they struggled with a new sense of purpose. But obviously, it's related to head trauma. Research shows that head trauma increases the risk of anxiety, depression, panic disorders, psychosis, PTSD, suicide. I mean, almost the whole litany of mental illness issues. And because most psychiatrists never look at the brain, they have no clue what we're dealing with. And I've seen maybe 20,000 people who've had the chronic effects of traumatic brain injury, and they increase your risk of virtually every psychiatric problem. And the homelessness epidemic, brand new study, 50% of people who are homeless had a significant brain injury before they were homeless. And so it is the silent epidemic that is stealing the health of our society. And very few people know about it. You know, professional footballers and rugby players and soccer players know about CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Talked about my work with NFL players. But I'm actually not a big fan of that whole concept because it's an autopsy diagnosis. And for me, I want your brain way before autopsy. And it sort of implies there's nothing you can do about it, which is complete nonsense because 80% of my NFL players show improvement in as little as two months if you put them on the right program. So Aiden, given your history, what I want you to do is be real. It's like, okay, I'm vulnerable. I've had multiple hits to my head. Well, what are the things I can do today to make it better? And what are the things I can do today to avoid the things that will make it worse? And that's the ultimate act of love you can do for your wife and children. It's the ultimate act of love is taking care of your brain so you don't become a burden to them or a source of stress for them. And, you know, I have four children. I love my four children. But quite frankly, I never want to have to live with them. <laughs> you know, I never want to be a burden to them. And I never want to lose my independence. And so the ultimate act of love is taking care of your brain so you can be the best person possible. And just to bring this to life, a great case study you share in here is the case study of YouTube star Logan Paul, who has been known to do things that were risky and perhaps of ill taste. And you share a case study of him in the book. Yeah, we actually did a video together, got 3 million views of him coming and getting his scan. And I'm like, so why are you here? And he said, I want to know why I'm a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Good self-awareness, right? You know, that's very insightful. And he just made some really big bonehead decisions that got him in a lot of trouble. And he had a head injury when he was in seventh grade. He had a trampoline accident and cracked his skull. 
So the easy thing is to say he's bad. The harder thing is to ask why. It's the more thoughtful thing. It's the more intelligent thing to do than just judge people as bad. The smarter thing is to go, why and can we make it better? Which is why I absolutely love your work, because you give us the tools to take control. Like you said to me, the ultimate act of of bravery as well is to actually do something about it myself and not wait till I become a burden in some way. So the next, the T, so we keep moving on the Bright Minds mnemonic, is T is for toxins, of which there are everywhere. And you shared that story earlier on about the furniture fumes. But I'd love if you shared a little bit here about particularly things like alcohol, tobacco, and one that's becoming more and more acceptable, but you've shown is actually so damaging for the brain, which is cannabis. Yeah, I'm not a fan of it. And, you know, I'm like... You know, people love football, hate me. People love alcohol, hate me. People love <laughs> caffeine, hate me. And I'm like, you're really going to go after marijuana? And, and and I have no dog in the fight, right? I mean, I don't own a cannabis company. I, I don't own an anti-cannabis company. You know, I make more money if you smoke cannabis because you're more likely to come see me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the scans don't lie. We published a study on a thousand pot smokers. Every area of their brain was lower compared to healthy people who weren't smoking cannabis. I published another study, the world's largest imaging study on 62,454 scans on how the brain ages. And then we went and looked at lifestyle factors and marijuana was the worst. It actually aged the brain worse than smoking by itself and even alcohol. And that, quite frankly, it surprised me because alcohol is not a health food either. The cannabis one was really shocking. And one of the reasons I wanted to share that was I've done shows in the past which covered the benefits of cannabis as well. So I wanted to give the opposing view and also the view where you actually view and you look at the brains as well, because I suppose I was somewhere in the middle and it was, it was great to understand both sides of the story. But the next of the Bright Minds is M, which is for mind storms, abnormal brain electrical activity. Well, and it's one, you know, many of my colleagues just have no clue about. But if you have abnormal electrical activity in your temporal lobes, you have mood instability, irritability, temper problems, and it often comes from a head injury. It responds to anti-seizure interventions or natural interventions that decrease seizure frequency, but it's a brain thing. It's not a mind thing. It's a brain thing that gives you a mind thing. So that's why I don't like, again, the term mental illness, because it's abnormal electrical activity in your brain that, you know, when we do physical, inter I mean, you can do psychotherapy from now until the cow jumps over the moon and it's not going to work. And so it's sort of unfair to assume these are mental illnesses when in fact it has to do with your brain. The second eye of Bright Minds is immunity and infections. And here you list a multitude, but a couple I thought we could share and people can catch easily, I suppose, are Candida and Toxo. Well, toxoplasmosis is so interesting, but it's very common and it's associated with suicide and schizophrenia, depression, and I see how it ravages the brain. And if you never look, you can go, oh, he's depressed or oh, he's suicidal. And you can find reasons in anybody's family for them to be unhappy. So if you never look, you never know. And then you come up with all sorts of theories about why a person is the way they are and completely miss their brains infected. I mentioned candida as well. Which is a very common fungal infection that people get either on their skin or in their GI tract, in their gut, and it can make you anxious, it can make you overweight, it can make you tired, it can make you depressed. And again, if you never test for it, how would you ever know? Another one of these infections is Lyme disease, which according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, is at epidemic proportions. And there's sort of a horrifying new book called Bitten that 
talks about how Lyme was actually developed as a biological weapon of war. And it may have been released in the Northeast. But if you take a map of the United States and you look at the highest incidence of Lyme, it's in the Northeast, the North Midwest, and the West Coast. And then you overlay the highest incidence of schizophrenia, they're nearly identical. And so in my mind, if you have a psychotic illness in any of these high Lyme states, someone should at least screen you for Lyme as well and treat it if there are signs that you might have it. Wow, that's amazing. And just with toxoplasmosis, a lot of people have cats, particularly, you know, around Europe, a lot of people have cats and keep them as company, etc. But it's one of the main ways people get toxoplasmosis. Correct. Especially if they have outdoor cats. So if you got a kitten and the kitten's never been outdoors, less likely to have toxo. But outdoor cats, if they eat a rat, so if toxo has infected the rat, it actually turns the rat into a cat seeking missile. So when the rat smells cat urine, it goes toward the cat, which is not that smart, rather than away from it. This parasite's very insidious and can actually change the behavior of the animal to make it more likely that the cat will be infected, which then infect humans through the feces of the cat. That one's amazing because it just shows you how a parasite can infect the brain and change your behavior, which teases up nicely for the next one, which is neurohormone issues and how neurohormone imbalances have an immense impact on behavior. Hormones are like miracle grow for the brain. Hormones like thyroid, testosterone, DHEA, insulin, estrogen, progesterone, pregnenolone are really important for how you feel. And if your hormones aren't right, you're more likely to be anxious. You're more likely to be depressed. You're more likely to have temper problems. You're more likely to get divorced. You're more likely to have ADHD. So getting your hormones tested, I think each year, getting them tested and then optimized is incredibly important. And one of the things I am seeing more and more is low testosterone in teenage boys. It's like, why would teenage boys have low testosterone? Head trauma, very common cause, uh, because it damages part of the brain that tells you to make hormones. And our sugar-laden diets, and so kill the sugar, lift weights, all of those things can dramatically improve your hormone levels. And in the book, there's all sorts of strategies to help. You even have a whole chapter on a suggested diets, et cetera, et cetera. But we mentioned earlier on Dave and Bonnie and how the fumes and the toxins had affected Dave and made him into a jerk. But you also mentioned with neurohormones that they can change over time and affect people and affect their marriages massively. And I thought it'd be worth sharing estrogen dominance. So it's really sort of like blood flow to the brain. You want balance. And with estrogen dominance, women have heavy periods, often painful periods, breast tenderness, but they can get moody, angry, irritable, and look like sort of full-blown psychiatric illness, mental illness, but it's not mental, it's brain. And when you balance their estrogen, they just do so much better. That chapter I found absolutely fascinating. But the next chapter was the D, which is diabetes, which is a huge epidemic, which we might just skim over here because I think everybody's aware of how big a problem this one is. So they're aware it's a big problem, that they're not aware as their brain, as their BMI or their body mass index goes up, as their weight goes up, the actual physical size and function of their brain goes down. And that should just scare the fat off everybody. So with this massive, no pun intended, problem, 70% of Americans are overweight, 40% are obese. It just keeps going up. It's the biggest brain drain in the history of the United States. 
And if you're overweight or obese, it means you have five of the 11 bright minds risk factors. Because if you're overweight, you have low blood flow to the brain. I published two studies on that. If you're overweight, you have inflammation. The fat in your belly produces inflammatory cytokines that increase inflammation throughout your whole body. If you're overweight, it stores toxins because fat stores toxins like lead and arsenic and mercury. And all of us, you know, we're exposed to heavy metals, but the more weight on your body, the heavier your load and belly fat turns healthy testosterone that we just talked about how important it is into unhealthy cancer promoting forms of estrogen. And so just being overweight gives you five of the 11 risk factors. And that means we need to get serious about exercise, about not eating too much and being really thoughtful, which is why there's a whole chapter called Food Made Insanely Simple on, you know, eat this, don't eat that. You know, people go, oh, but I love my food. Well, I love my brain way more than any food that I could eat. And ultimately, you want to only eat foods you love that love you back. And I love what you're doing as well. You're trying to get this into schools. You're trying to educate people at a very young age. So these habits don't get harder and harder to change as they grow older. But the next and the final one of the bright minds is is sleep. And it's one I've traditionally not paid attention to. And not from staying up, binge watching Netflix, etc. But trying to squeeze the most out of my day. But reading your book and reading other books on sleep really changed my view on it. You know, I'm so happy for you because if you don't sleep seven hours a night, you actually have lower overall blood flow to the brain, which means more bad decisions. And sleep is just absolutely essential. What we've seen is that things like sleep apnea triple the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so you want to avoid things that steal your sleep, and engage in things that help sleep. One of the things you say here is like at nighttime, it's the time your brain takes out the neural trash. Right. I mean, we just found that out a few years ago that when you sleep, your brain cleans or washes itself. And if you don't sleep, trash builds up. And there's this great study. I'm doing a project now with a police department and soldiers who got six hours of sleep at night or more were 98% accurate on the range. I'm sorry, seven hours of sleep or more, 98% accurate on the range. Soldiers who only got six hours of sleep were 50% accurate on the range. And those that got five hours of sleep were 35% accurate on the range. And four hours of sleep, they were dangerous with only 15% accuracy on the range. And sleep deprivation actually kills more people on the highway than alcohol abuse. With sleep, you mentioned nutraceuticals. This would be a great point to talk about nutraceuticals versus mind meds. But for example, a nutraceutical you mentioned is melatonin with sleep or 5-HTP or even magnesium. You know, I'm a huge fan of supplements. And you know, I have my own supplement company and it's like, well, why do you have a supplement company? It's because in my, in medical school, all of us learn first do no harm. And what most physicians are never taught is the science behind supplementation. So for example, melatonin has a level scientific evidence that it can help for sleep. A level, just meaning it has more than two randomized placebo controlled trials. And well, would I want to use melatonin or Ambien? Well, people get hooked on Ambien and it can cause all sorts of side effects where melatonin, no one gets hooked on it and it doesn't cause any side effects by and large for most people. And the research shows that melatonin, magnesium, zinc, iron, 5-HTP and GABA can all work for sleep. Now, you don't have to do everything at once, but you can try the different ones and go, well, what really helps me? 
along with behaviors like avoiding anything that steals your sleep, caffeine, blue light at night, a warm room, noise, alcohol, you know, whatever, avoid things that hurt it and then do things that help it. And one of my favorite things I talk about in the book is hypnosis, that I've made hundreds of hypnosis audios for people over the years. And on our website, we have a website called Brain Fit Life. We actually have a sleep hypnosis audio that helps people go to sleep. So why don't we do the natural things first? And then if they don't work, consider medications. And there's a whole chapter in the book called Mind Meds versus Nutraceuticals. And I say, well, what would I do first if you had ADHD before I'd give you medicine? What about addictions? What about anxiety? What about depression or insomnia? Now, if you have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or a psychotic process, I would first give you medicine. And then I do all the other good things for you as well, because you'll probably need less medicine. But for all of those other things, I generally start with natural ways to heal the brain. And that's completely the opposite of what my colleagues, and many of them have really become pharmaceutical reps, is they start with meds, they see you back in a month, and they're just managing the meds and the side effects of the meds without ever talking to you about your diet or exercise or any of the bright minds risk factors and that's the hard thing isn't it because that's much harder it's easy to just give somebody a pill or to scatter gun try a few different pills and hopefully that one of them lands and that's what i love about this work but you mentioned their add and adhd and which is often linked with creativity and it's been one of your primary areas of expertise. And there's a great deal of negativity bias towards it, and particularly towards medication in our society. Common words we hear are, I'm not going to drug my kid. And if you take this drug, you won't be creative. You won't be yourself anymore. And I'd love if you shared your thoughts on this, because you say it has pros and cons, and it all depends on if it's needed or not. I am not an anti-medicine person. I think I'm just a rational medicine person. It's let's do natural things first. And if they don't work, medication can save your life. And ADHD has been an expertise of mine. I know more about it than I really want to know. Uh, my wife has it. Three of my four children have it. And it's stressful for people. But if you have a short attention span, you're easily distracted, disorganized. You tend to procrastinate. You're impulsive or restless. It's important to get it assessed. And in the book, I talk about, well, what are the natural things to do? But if they don't work or they don't work fully, a little bit of some of the ADHD medicines, if you have the right type, I actually wrote a book called Healing ADD, where I talk about seven different types. And Aiden, you'll love how I start the book. I start the book by saying, I know you're not going to read this book. Uh, <laughs> nice. But read the first five pages and then, you know, you can go to the section that applies to you. So know if you have it, try the natural things first, know your type of ADD, but medication can be life-saving. I have one of my kids uh, who has the inattentive type of ADD and because she was never hyperactive or restless, it actually took me a long time to find it. But when I scanned her, I found it. and a little bit of medicine, she went from B's and C's working her brains out to literally straight A's for 10 years and got into the University of Edinburgh's veterinarian school, which is one of the best vet schools in the world. So if I wouldn't have figured it out and used a little bit of medication, she would have never reached her potential, which is ultimately what I want for her. And obviously what you want for the world with all this brilliant work you're doing. Daniel, I'd love if you'd share the Bright Minds rules. Here are simple solutions that people can take. And if they want to deeper dive into each of these rules, they can get the book, which is coming out in, in March. And that gives a full list of the foods. But I'd love if you give a quick top line on each of them, please. I love the chapter title, Food Made Insanely Simple. This doesn't have to be hard. 
Rule number one, only love foods that love you back. So know the less. Two, go for the highest quality calories you can find and not too many of them if you need to lose weight. I think of calories like money. And if you overspend, you're going to become bankrupt. Three is hydrate and don't drink your calories. 1982, on average, Americans drank 225 calories a day. 2017, on average, they drank 450 calories a day. That extra 225 calories a day will put an extra 23 pounds of fat a year on your body. No wonder we're always on a diet. The first thing, if you need to lose weight, is stop drinking your calories. Four is high quality protein at every meal because they help balance your blood sugar and keep cravings away. High quality fat is five because your brain is 60% fat. Low fat diets are bad for the brain. Six, go for smart carbohydrates. What are those? Colorful, low glycemic, high fiber carbohydrates. So low glycemic means they don't raise your blood sugar. So it basically means limit or eliminate gluten, rice, pasta, potatoes, and sugar. Seven is use herbs and spices like medicine. There's all sorts of research on things like saffron and curcumin from turmeric, pepper, rosemary, sage, oregano. Eight is make your food as clean as possible. So eliminate artificial sweeteners, colors, and preservatives. Nine is if you struggle with any brain health or mental health issue, eliminate any potential allergens. So I'm a fan of getting rid of sugar, MSG, gluten, corn, soy, and dairy for at least a month and see if they might have a negative impact on you. 10 is use intermittent fasting. Go 12 to 16 hours between dinner and your first meal of the day. 11 is get a routine that serves your health rather than hurts it. And as I told you that story earlier, you really want to find 20 or, you know, in this young person's life, 75 foods you love that love you back. So you don't have this depression, this deprivation mindset. Yeah, and I love the way you empower us to take control of our own brains here. Daniel, for people who want to find out more about you, your work, Eamon Clinics, the online courses you mentioned, where can they find out more? So if people go to endofmentalillness.com, they can pre-order the book and get lots of free gifts, including cookbook and a Bright Minds poster to make it really easy to understand, and also a 50% off discount at brainmd.com, which is our supplement company. One of the things you mentioned as well, you mentioned where people can find out more about your work, but there's a six-week challenge, which I've signed up for as well, which you're giving away for free, which I think I'd, I'd love if you'd share where to find this and what it is with our listeners. Well, thank you so much for asking. You know, as I talk about in the book, the end of mental illness begins with a revolution in brain health. And so my job is to create brain warriors or brain health revolutionaries. And to that end, starting January 21st, we are going to do a six week challenge free to sign up. My wife, Tan and I are going to do six live classes starting Tuesday, January 21st at five o'clock Pacific time in the U S and then every day for six weeks, we have something simple for you to do to create this revolution of brain health in you and your family. And at the end, we're going to give away over $22,000 in prizes, including $5,000 in cash, a free evaluation at Amen Clinics and all sorts of other goodies. But the real benefit to you is if you stick with this, it can literally change your mood. It can change your sense of relaxation, it can improve your memory and your focus and, you know, if we're going to create this revolution, we need people to carry this message forward. And Daniel, if you had one sentence that you would tell people, what is it? What way would you leave this show for somebody to go away and take control of their own brain? The end of mental illness begins with a revolution in brain health. If you want a better mind and a better brain, it starts with this one question. 
is this good for my brain or bad for it? And if you can answer that with information and love, your brain will be better 10 years from now. And that is just so exciting. And I pulled a quote that I thought would be a lovely way to wrap up the show, but also solidify your mission. And I love this. Your brain creates your mind. The issues that affect our minds stem from our brains, our bodies, our thoughts, our social and work interactions with others, and our deepest sense of meaning and purpose. And Daniel Amen for changing the paradigm, for overcoming the amount of criticism and resistance, for being a change maker, and for making such a difference to not only individuals, but generations of family. This show, me, and I'm sure our listeners, thank you. Daniel Amen, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.